My name is Zachary McNaughton, and I am not a professional angler. I've been fishing for over 20 years, and the one thing that these years have taught me most is that I have a lot to learn. So let's meet some of Vermont's true master anglers, and together we'll discover some fishing techniques and explore the many species that this great state has to offer. Today I'm heading up to Job's Pond to meet up with Vermont Fish and Wildlife biologist Judd Crotzer. Judd has invited me to ride along as his team samples the brook trout population and also checks to make sure that no one has introduced any invasive species into this lake. An electro fishing boat works pretty well to catch a bunch of fish compared to the other methods that we might use on the lake or pond. We've got a, a big generator that makes a lot of electricity, makes a lot of power and then we can take that uh, through this GPP unit and convert the electrical waves into forms and frequencies that are best suited for drawing fish into the wands and then when they get in close to stun them without killing them. We can use electrofishing on lakes and ponds to sample a lot of different species but it only reaches down about, say, nine feet. And uh, with brook trout and lake trout as well, we'll sample them in the fall because they're spawning in the fall, which means they're in shallower water. We've been sampling the brook trout population on Job's Pond almost every year since 2006. So it's been about 12 years. The reason we've been doing that, one reason is because this is a special pond and we want to just keep an eye on it. It's, it's very unique in having so many wild brook trout and, of, and the, the large size that we have there. The data we've been collecting is catch rate, so we know the amount of time that we electrofished and we know the total number of fish that we've caught. So that's something that gives you a, an estimate of the, it, it doesn't, you, you can't actually estimate the abundance of fish, but it, you know, if you catch a lot of fish in a certain amount of time, it means that there's more fish than if your catch rate is a lot less. Uh, the other thing we do is we measure and weigh them so we know the size structure of the population and that's something that's important for monitoring you know, the, the health of the population because we want to see all different lengths there. We want to see little ones being born and growing up and we want to, and we want to see the big ones and everything in between. If you're missing something there that could be an indication that there's something to be concerned about. Centuries ago, pretty much all of the small, definitely higher elevation, and even some of the lower elevation ponds in Vermont would have had brook trout in them, and they would have been wild brook trout. Many things have changed. Land use has changed. Um, we've affected water quality and, wa and habitat in, in the lakes and ponds. But one of the big things that we've done, starting in the late 1800s, was to move lots of different fish species to lots of different places, including a lot of these ponds that had wild brook trout populations in them. And brook trout in ponds, they do well in ponds, they grow big and they can get abundant, but they do not compete well with other fish species. So if you have other warm water fish species like perch or bass or pickerel, they do a better job of getting the food in a pond. They also can eat brook trout. So it's usually if you have a warm water fish population established in a pond, usually you're not gonna have brook trout. Fish? Yeah, yeah there, there we go. Nice one. In order to target these fall brook trout, we'll be using the same techniques we did for the fall fish. I'm throwing a Joe's fly spinner while Judd throws a Phoebe spoon. I was just thinking as we were going through that spot that this would be the place where we should get them. We're targeting rocky points in boulder fields in depths that range from three to eight feet. Oops. Oops. Unfortunately, it's just a little too big for me to keep. It's in the slot. So explain the slot limit on uh, this body of water. Well, right now on Job's and Martin's ponds, we have a protected slot limit 
of 12 to 15 inches. So a fish between, a brook trout between 12 and 15 inches needs to be released. And there's a reduced creel limit as well. So you're only allowed to keep two fish per day. Uh, the main reason we did that is we knew from um, we knew from sampling that these were places that ha had uh, had good populations of wild brook trout, including some big ones. And the amount of fishing harvest we knew, at least at Job's, was pretty significant relative to the number of fish. So we wanted to. Um, reduce the harvest a bit in order to increase the abundance of fish. Not necessarily to ship the size bigger, but to have a higher abundance, a higher catch rate of brook trout. There's one. Same area. Close, anyway. Basically what we're doing is slowly reeling our lures across the rocks in hopes that a nearby brook trout is willing to chase and bite same size. Brook trout just, they'll fight to the death if you let <laughs> yeah. them. Yeah, they're feisty little things. That one is a male, I think. He's got the kite, not much other coloration. Yep, that one's in the slot too. Just over 12 inches. Beautiful fish. Yeah, pretty. After the first couple fish, we went quite some time without a bite. At that point, Judd suggested that we tip our hooks with a tiny piece of night crawler. I don't have a whole lot of worms. These are just one that I dug out of my garden. So, yeah, I'm just putting a little chunk like that. Okay. There's right. one. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that one's a keeper. Cool. So, tipping with the worm, top secret trick. <laughs> now, will that help with rainbows too, you think? Probably. It's a pretty well known trick amongst northern New England brook trout fishermen, I believe, especially fishing ponds. but something flashy to get their attention and something tasty to seal the deal. I think one of the most important things about fishing brook trout ponds is being there at the right time. And because brook trout need cold water, the best time to fish for them is when the water's cold. So that might, that's usually gonna be in the, either the spring or the fall. The best time in the spring is when the black flies are the worst, so in May. And I think that's one reason why people don't experience the best brook trout fishing that they could is because it can be hard to be on the water in those times because there's so many bugs. Um, but that, you, you gotta suffer through it. Uh, if Maybe you need to get a bug jacket, um, that's what I use. Um, and, but then as the water warms through the summer, they need, to find, they need to find cold water. So the way that brook trout survive in a pond is they go to a spring seep where there's cold water coming in. And they'll be concentrated there and if you know where that spring seep is, you can have some really good fishing at times. Uh, they'll turn on for part of the day to eat. Um, but most people don't know where those are. Um, the other thing in the summer is there's often loons around. So they're having to fi find cold water to survive and also avoid getting eaten. So it's, it's, a, it's a stressful time for them. But then once we get to the fall, the loons have gone, the water's cooling off they're moving in shallow looking to spawn and you can have some really good fishing again in the fall um, and usually not much uh, other competition. A lot of people have turned their thoughts to hunting or whatever, they just aren't thinking about fishing in the fall. Uh, even though that's a, one of the best times of the year to fish for trout. These fish haven't seen a lure probably for a couple months at this point uh, because nobody's been fishing there and the water temperature is just right and they're active because they're getting ready to spawn. Currently, we only have in the north, in northeastern Vermont, we only have about eight ponds that have 
populations of wild brook trout that are robust enough to provide quality fishing opportunities. And we have a few others in the spine of the Green Mountains, high up in the Green Mountains. Um, so these are special resources that we want to protect. One of the biggest threats to these remaining wild brook trout ponds would be the introduction of non-native species. And the main way that these non-native species are moving around today is by anglers doing it. They, maybe they don't know that there are brook trout there. Uh, maybe they don't think that adding those fish would affect the brook trout. Maybe they think they can have bass and brook trout. Or maybe they just don't care. Um, but people are still moving bass and crappie and pike around the state. And we really don't want that to happen. So one of the reasons that we have the special test waters designation on Job's Pond and Martin's Pond is because we want the brook trout population to be abundant. Uh, we want a, a, as high a catch rate as we can have so that you know people go there, they catch fish, they know that these are good brook trout ponds, they know that we are managing these for wild brook trout. We don't need other species introduced. So. Uh, it also, when you have a special regulation on a water, it kind of points to it that this is something special. We are managing this in a special way. Uh, these are special brook trout ponds that have wild brook trout and large ones, and we want to keep them that way. So by uh, you know, educating people about what these ponds offer, and also by having some special regulations in place that hopefully will increase the catch rate, um, hopefully that encourages people to not make the mistake of introducing other fish species to these ponds. Thanks for watching this episode of Vermont Master Anglers. For more content, visit our Facebook page at Vermont Master Anglers. If you're watching us on YouTube, please like and subscribe.